Good evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to this live program at All Three Principles. Today, our guest upon us is Dr. Mohammed Imam from Surrey, United Kingdom. Dr. Imam is a consultant orthopedic surgeon at the Rowley Bristol Orthopedic Center at Surrey, United Kingdom. After his specialist training in the UK, Dr. Imam completed fellowships at the Wright Kingdom Upper Limb Unit in the Royal Orthopedic Hospital, Birmingham, followed by fellowships at the Mayo Clinic and the Stedman Philip Research Institute at Colorado, United States. Dr. Imam has several publications and book chapters to his credit. So today, it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Mohammed Imam from Ovati Imam. Thank you very much, uh, Tej, for the lovely presentation. And thank you for everyone who's attending uh, this meeting. Uh, I'll hope it will be an interesting uh, talk for all of you. What I'm going to talk about here would be for arm uh, injuries. It's a big topic. Of, we'll try to cover a few of the common injuries uh, that occurs in the forearm. And uh, I'm, as uh, I have mentioned, I am uh, a consultant and academic and uh, specializing in upper limb surgery. And the upper limb uh, trauma is uh, of a great interest of mine. So for uh, the first thing that we need to talk about is who sees these injuries? And the answer is everyone. And that's really important. So these are the, we, in, in, this is really important because we are going to discuss about uh, most of forearm injuries, including uh, postponed forearms, Essex leprosy, Montagia, Giliazi, as well as complications. First thing we have to know for sure, diaphyseal forearm fractures uh, is uh, a common injury and it should be managed properly. And it is a sort of injury that can be managed in any DGH, in any place, or in any place on earth. And so, and motion in the human forearm is a complex interaction between the radius and the ulna produced by a combination of multiple muscles working together. And surgical reconstruction of this requires a precise realignment of both bones in order to achieve um, and uh, maximize the function. So the forearm, we I'll go through some basics first, and then we'll go through some surgical details and then techniques and tricks and tips uh, for those who are undertaking their exit exams or those who are, are attending this uh, webinar purely for the sake of uh, knowledge and experience. Uh, we now look at the forearm as a single functional unit composed of three rockers, lockers, like in the foot of ankle, in the foot and ankle, which are the three lockers in, as in this picture, are involved in the stability of the forearm, ranging where uh, this includes the proximal and distal radio ulnar joint, as well as the middle radio ulnar joint, which is composed of the interosseous membrane, the radial shaft, ulnar shaft, uh, as well. And Lester has stated many years ago, nothing influenced the eventual recovery of hand function more than mechanism and force of injury. And this is certainly the same for forearm injury. And so accurate anatomic uh, an, uh, anatomic reconstruction of the pony anatomy is required for perfect functioning of the forearm during rotation. So fractures and of the radius and the ulna can be regarded as articular fractures. And, the, and so we should deal with them uh, in the same principles. And these include anatomic reconstruction. Think about the forearm as a ring connected proximally with the interosseous membrane in the middle and the distal radio ulna joint. Force transmission occurs through the interosseous membrane from the radius distally to the ulna proximally. And so on lateral projection of the radius and ulna, you can see that the relationship of the interosseous membrane to the radius and ulna during forearm rotation change as per each degree. And the interosseous membrane fibers are longest with the forearm in neutral position and shorten both in pronation and supination. And that would be important. And we'll discuss that later as well uh, in the course of this presentation. Uh, the motion of the forearm is a complex interaction between the radius and the ulna. The radius rotates around the longitudinal axis that pass 
through the center of the radial head at the proximal radio ulnar joint. And this goes towards the center of the ulna distally, and that matters when you're reconstructing these. And with rotation biomechanically, the radius rotates around the ulna, and the ulna moves in a varus, a vulgus direction, about nine degrees at the elbow. And this allows the ulnar head to move out of the way of the rotating radius distally. So at the distal radio ulnar joint, the motion between 50 degrees of supination and 50 degrees of pronation uh, is almost pure rotation. But at the extremes of range of motion, the radius translates in a dorsal direction during pronation and palmar direction during supination. So movement at the proximal radio ulnar joint is purely rotation. This is important to understand why some of those patients we reconstruct after complex elbow fractures have stiffness and they lose the last degrees of rotation. Another aspect we should know that actually, uh, which was uh, which was uh, demonstrated by Matthews here in this paper published in 1982. In that cadaveric study, they found that 10 degrees of angulation of one or both bones of the forearm will lead to 20 degrees of pronation and supination. So that uh, and so that should dictate our treatment. We the natural history is highly dependent on the position of the healing of those two for our bones. So it's reasonable to consider non-operative treatment if of an isolated ulnar fracture with less than 10 degrees of angulation. But non-operative treatment of both bone for arm usually is associated with poor outcome. So what we should be considering then? Uh, we have to understand another thing that why reconstructing the, the radius we have to do our very best to reconstruct the radial bow. And with pro because think about it that way, the radius lies parallel to the ulna in supination. With pronation around the ulna, while the ulna maintains its position through forearm rotation, the radial shaft rotates. And think is the radial shaft is triangular in cross section. And Schmidt uh, published uh, their study about how to devise a formula that can allow us to define the magnitude of the radial bow. And in order to do that, the distance y here is the length of the radius as measured from the bicipital to prosty. Uh, a is the line perpendicular to Y from the point of greatest curvature. And the distance X is actually the length of the radius from the bicipital to prostate to the point where A intersects Y. And you can calculate the radial bowing X over Y times 100. And I think that's important, especially in young patients where it matters. Another point to understand also about biomechanics, which I think is also uh, important to understand if you're managing these injuries, sapiceps insertion. Sapiceps insert at the apex of the smaller proximal bow. As a result, sapiceps need to be much larger to overcome the disadvantage of insertion into a small bowing. A uh, small bow for balance supination. And the arrangement is the ulna is the converse of the radius. So that allows a shallow proximal bow where the anconius inserts in, at the apex for, uh, for valgus of the elbow. And uh, that's why uh, when reconstructing uh, the distal biceps, it's re really important to reconstruct the Anato to undertake an anatomic reconstruction. So let's start now about what we care about more broken bones. It's critical whenever you see these patients with single or double or both bone fracture to evaluate the distal radio ulnar joint and radio capitular joint preoperatively, intraoperatively and postoperatively in order to avoid missing agliasi or Montagia type injuries. So for arm injuries, so what we do next? We have, there, there are different for forearm, uh, for single forearm injuries, 
it's crucial to understand whether there's an associated dislocation of the proximal or distal joint in all of them. Fixation technique should be tailored to the age of the patient and the location and the pattern of the fracture. Always remember that excellent functional results and union rates can be obtained when skeletal length and alignment are restored with a stable internal fixation. It's really crucial to exclude other, uh, other uh, to exclude neurological symptoms. And we, these are basic stuff. And what happened, neurological examination, it's really crucial to understand the basics of uh, neurology while uh, how to assess these patients, especially for your SHOs, your younger residents who are seeing these patients, because the risk of nerve injuries is uh, high among these injuries. And uh, you can easily assess them by thumb up, OK sign, cross sign, and power grip. This is uh, one quick way of assessing the neurology. Having said that, I think, uh, Sarah, neurological examination is also really important when you're uh, when uh, we're seeing these patients. So the other bit uh, that's really important on managing forearm injuries is which approach to use. The dorsal approaches I think uh, might demand, uh, needs, must demand identification of the PIN proximally and the superficial radial nerve branches distally. Distal third ulnar approaches needs, uh, dictates uh, identification of the dorsal cutaneous branch of the ulnar nerve. Separate approaches are needed for the radius and ana always in order to minimize the risk of synostosis. For middle and distal third radius fracture, you can stabilize them through the volar approach. Proximal third fracture, I tend to stabilize them either volar or posterior approach based on the fracture geometry. Proximal third fractures uh, require exposure of the radial neck. You can always approach dorsally, of course, and include the cookers. I, we, there is a five step uh, five uh, steps uh, algorithm for uh, identification, which approach to use first, finding an interval between the longitudinal oriented superficial muscles, preserving vessels uh, and nerves, understanding anatomy of the deeper muscles, and knowing where to lift these muscles to expose the bone, and, and knowing as well the shape of the bones themselves and the relation to each other, also understanding that you know if you're approaching the radius distally you pronate to take the pi in uh, away from your surgical incision or supinate uh, from other for other approaches if you are uh, if, uh, you know, at uh, at each level you have also to identify the fix other fixation tricks like you can see here the ain and pin are uh, there is always a risk of uh, injuring them with reduction clamps Always be cautious using monopolar cautery on the ulnar aspect of the radius. The forearm is a very muscular uh, structure uh, and uh, you, anatomical unit. Uh, you have to uh, always aim for proper hemostasis whenever uh, you can. Also, another important uh, bit uh, to understand that the radius has complex osteology. We suppose the radial and the sagittal bow. The radial bow has an arc of approximately 10 degrees and lies in the coronal mid shaft, while the sagittal one has approximately five degrees arc and lies in the proximal third of the radius. That's important. Uh, if you're using uh, regular plates, contouring of the anterior plates on the proximal radius can accommodate for the sagittal bow. And the anatomic plates are available to accommodate the radial bow whenever needed. The, uh, what about the anna? In the anna, the anna is generally flat on the sagittal plane and curved in the coronal plane with the exception of the proximal anna, which in some patients has a slightly apex posterior curvature at the olecranon. In the middle and distal thirds of the forearm plate fixation can be placed anterior or posterior to avoid symptomatic hardware. However, in proximal ulnar shaft fractures, plate placement, we tend to do it on the subcutaneous border. And if you think about it, although it's possibly more symptomatic, but that obvi obviates 
the need for plate contouring because of the ulnar coronal bow we discussed earlier. The placement also help resist the forces generated uh, during elbow flexion and extension from the long lever of the forearm. Also, what else we need to do? You know, close treatment of uh, radius or post forearm usually isn't the best option and yields unacceptable results. If the pay, it all depends on patient demographics. So we tend not to manage them non-operatively if we can. Plate fixation using 3.5 compression plate uh, is a standard care, yielding good or excellent function, functional results and union rates of greater than 95%. It's really important to restore the forearm rotation, uh, maintaining the proper skeletal length and rotational alignment, and always check the distal radio ulnar joint, proximal radio ulnar joint at any time point. So which fracture to do first? That's a good question. I think it's always the easier fracture to do first. That's how I do. And that's what most of upper uh, limb surgeons agreed to do. So the less comminuted bone you fix first so that you have the most precise restoration of lens. So if they are similar, I'll start with the radius because for an important uh, uh, trick here, because radial fractures are stabilized with the arm extended, while the ulna are is typically stabilized with the elbow flexed at 90 degrees because of the positioning. Therefore, it is indicated to fix the radius first so that you allow for a stable forearm during elbow fraction, sorry, elbow flexion for ulnar flag fixation. Three, six cortices, 3.5 millimeter compression plate, six cortices, so three screws on either side are the standard of care. Uh, uh, also anatomic plates can be helpful in restoring the radial bow. And the formula we've proposed would be an easy tip in order to understand what type of bowing you have. I would use uh, locking screws in osteoporotic bones. Uh, locked plates are indicated uh, when bridging a defect or one segment is very short or six cortices of fixation isn't uh, available. Also care must be taken to ensure plates and screws placed on both the distal ulna and the proximal radius does not impinge in each respective radio ulnar joint. Always remember locked unicortical screws must sometimes be used to avoid screw tip prominence in the joint. Live intraoperative fluoroscopic examination is used to assess screw placement in the distal or proximal radio ulnar joint. And it is really critical to pronosopinate the uh, forearm to ensure there is no plate impingement on these. I tend to leave the fascia open at the end of my fixation. Uh, you have to remember also importantly that compartment syndrome can be a risk. I tend to avoid regional block when I'm doing stabilization of these, especially in older injuries. I tend not to close the forearm fascia uh, 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 if I'm worried in these patients. And if you have um, a patient with compartment fascia to me would be the treatment of choice. Transverse fractures, these are tricky fractures. And I think, you know, generally speaking, reading what you can see here, for simple pattern mid shaft fractures, straight small fragment 33.5 compression type plate surface while with six cortices on each side of the fracture. A seven hole plate is typically chooses for an open hole left over the fracture side, unless you need to do an intrafragmentary screw. Uh, for distal third uh, radial fracture, you can stabilize through a long per a periarticular volar plating, which we, we do most of us nowadays all the time, or use a small fragmentary 3.5 compression. Plate can be contoured distally to match the end Interior metaphysical curvature of the distal radius. Comminuted fractures, you can use the contralateral 
step to evaluate normal anatomy for osteoporotic uh, special scenarios for osteoporotic i would consider doing locking screws and uh, if you're doing a posterior plating in the radius a straight compression plate can be manually contoured to edge of an unused anatomic anterior plate to make its incision proper so that's what I would tend to do estimated lever fracture. Uh, estimated lever is uh, marked incision centered on the fracture, and then uh, identify the lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm incision to be continued into the deep fascia. And the uh, pronator, uh, you can see at the preradialis muscle tendon mobilized, radial artery and nerve located, and you identify the muscles and then use surgical techniques as per AO principles. Usually, uh, so for oblique fractures, you can use a, a, a lobster claw bone reduction clamp on either side of the fracture and then order and then when the uh, clean the uh, fracture uh, fragments, reduction can be obtained using a longitudinal uh, traction and rotation can be maintained uh, in position with lobster clamp. The clamp can secure the fracture site. It's lifted, puts a plate underneath it, and of course, the rest is what you tend to do. This is a summary of what we are talking about for straightforward or nothing straightforward with, with the standard uh, bone uh, single or uh, both bone fractures. So what about other injuries? One of these uh, commonest injuries that we, it's not, un it's not uncommon, but it's a crucial injury. The Essex leprosity lesions, which is fracture of the radial head with concomitant disruption of the distal radio ulnar joint and rupture of the interosseous membrane in between. And in this type of injuries, it's, it can be missed and it's a drastic fracture. The gravity of the situation is always high. Although the injury is named after the British surgeon Essex Leprosty, he wasn't the first to report it. Brockman published uh, one uh, Brockman published uh, one possible early report of this injury in 1930 and they, he, they reported on two cases of radial head fractures associated with proximal migration of the radius uh, the second one actually who have reported uh, this Essex leprosy injury was Kerr and Co and the first confirmed case of Essex leprosy injury is actually attributed to them, who in 1946 reported on a patient with a radial head fracture and concom concomitant dislocation of the distal radial ulnar joint. And this injury occurred in a mining accident. It's an, so, uh, of course, uh, the young Essex leprosy surgeon in 1951 uh, reported uh, two cases uh, from Birmingham in the United Kingdom and uh, 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 Mr. Uh, Peter Essex Leprosty is the one who also reported calcaneal fractures. Uh, he reported two, sadly he died young at the age of 35 I think. So, although Essex Leprosty only reported the treatment of two patients, he made a very important observation about this injury. His first observation that this injury is uncommon, which we know then now. And also he highlighted the importance to inspect the distal radio ulnar joint when a radial fracture is present. This is because failure to recognize involvement of that joint can lead to severe complication of the distal ulnar radial joint, which druge, which would need a lot of additional surgeries. Also, he recognized importantly and smartly that excision of the radial head should be avoided at all times. And instead, reconstruction by reduction or tenor fixation can be used in pos uh, if possible. Therefore, he said, in case of severe comminution, a prosthesis can be used to replace the radial head and restore the longitudinal stability of the forearm, which is great observations that up the 60 years or 70 years after this observation, we still agree 
with these findings. The interosseous membrane is an important, uh, the interosseous ligament is an important ligament that spans the whole arm. And actually in order to have proper hand function, you need a stable forearm. And that's hence the importance of this injury. And we should be able to identify these injuries. And actually missing these injuries is associated with lower outcomes at all times. And uh, which was uh, the findings. And this was demonstrated and you can see the interosseous membrane goes from the ligament, main ligament, it goes for, is important for load transfer and prevent radius and ulna instability. Having these injuries, should, you should have a high, inner, a high suspicion whenever you see them, especially in uh, these, uh, uh, especially when you are seeing uh, these uh, injuries uh, at all uh, times. You can see here, this is, uh, a cadaveric uh, study looking at what happens. It, we know now that the stability of the IO, the interosseous membrane, and the triangular fibrocartilage to maintain axial forearm stability after radial head excision is actually 71% done through the uh, interosseous membrane and triangular fibrocartilage if there is absence of radial head. That's why it is important. If you have no radial head or the radial head excision, the system is relatively tight and it's really difficult to uh, maintain stability. Uh, that's why identification is important. There is always attempts of fixation. Uh, when you reconstruct uh, the radial head at all time points, uh, associated coronoid injuries, if there is any, understand the gravity of the situation, which have been demonstrated in many cadaveric and biomechanical studies. And uh, it is, uh, there are different techniques proposed in order to manage uh, to in order to reconstruct the interosseous membrane in these injuries. Uh, this includes uh, the Lars ligament, which is gaining popularity, which is a synthetic ligament. You can have a synthetic graft. Uh, this is a paper from Wrightington uh, with uh, from uh, Adam Watts uh, uh, from Wrightington. And uh, that's what I would prefer myself. L let's remember three important things here. These are rail injuries after high energy axial load. You need to address soft tissue injury and we have to warn all our patients at any, at all time points that these injuries are associated with poor outcome regardless of what we do. Then let's talk about the second, another one which is important and even commoner, the Gliazi fracture. Uh, in Gliazi fractures, uh, it is a fracture, as you know, of the of the radius with dislocation of the distal radio ulnar joint. Uh, it is uh, some regard this as a fracture of necessity, as uh, there is uh, an indication to manage it uh, with surgery in hundred percent of the time. We have to understand that most activities performed by the forearm, wrist, and hand occur from the mid prone position, with the wrist moving into extension and radial deviation. So the arc accelerating from to flexion and ulnar deviation before returning rest to neutral. So with this associated injury, the forearm cannot undertake uh, this function without sound ligaments and so hence why we need to reconstruct these ligaments at all time points. How to gauge the dislocation of the distal radio ulnar joint? Mino described a technique to interpret the lateral wrist radiographs where the radial styloid is uh, aligned with the center of the lunate and an assessment of the overlap of the radius and ulna is made. The head of the ulna should be completely obscured by the radius. If only part of the ulna is obscured by the radius, then there is subluxation of the head. But that's in case you see a lateral rest radiograph with the styloid at the center of the lunate. Any shift in the ulnar head is a subluxation. 
and when combined with radius fracture, that's a rib fracture dislocation or Gliese fracture dislocation. CT scan uh, in neutral pronation and supination is useful in interpreting the degree of the uh, of uh, uh, the radio ulnar joint congruity, and this is can be, uh, but we tend not to use that in the uh, acute setting. So. What do we need to do? So actually, let's get, so Giliazi describes this fracture 1934 as a fracture of the junction of the middle and distal thirds of the radius. And he highlighted the attention to of the associated dislocation or subluxation of the radio ulnar joint. So Garcia and uh, Garcia, Elias, and Toppins had graded the radio ulnar joint dislocation into three types pure soft tissue, intra articular, and extra articular. And then they graded the extra articular into type 3A and 3P. 3A is actually Gliese fractures, while 3P is the Essex leprosity injuries. And I think that's the most commonly used or uh, agreed open uh, classifications that we tend to use now a days. It's really important to understand the anatomy of the distal radio ulnar joint. The triangular fibro cartilage is a specialized structure, part meniscus, to allow compression of the relative shortening of the radius in pronation. And it's partly ligament. It has palmar and dorsal fibrils thickenings known as the palmar and dorsal radio ulnar ligaments. They attach to the distal palmar and dorsal rims of the sigmoid notch as separate bundles and have superficial fibers that attach to the ulnar styloid and deep fibers. So it's really understand, we need to understand how important the triangular fibro cartilage and how complex is the distal radio ulnar joint when we are facing these injuries. We should understand also that the distal interosseous membrane and distal oblique bundle is crucial in order to maintain the adequate function our rests need to do in different rotational alignment. This might be something to be discussed in details in a separate talk. However, it's really important to avoid missing these dislocations in order to understand the when we are faced with these complex injuries. Uh, injuries. Uh, so, we a CT scan is always uh, useful in maintaining the degree of uh, subluxation and dislocation. And uh, there is uh, Houston 1957 have popularized uh, the concept of the fracture of a necessity. And uh, Mac Dermid uh, have highlighted the importance of uh, CT scans in order to discuss and assess the congruity of these injuries, as you can see here. The, this, uh, this method, basically, if you look here, A is, uh, is you know, the radio ulnar ratio is measure, measuring subluxation on a CT scan, on axial CT scans, and uh, this, uh, you can see, following reduction, the all is reduced back into position. When you are undertaking fixation of uh, this uh, type of injuries, it's really important to understand as a chuck test, which is crucial to identify the stability of uh, the uh, distal radio ulnar joint. Intraoperative distal radio ulnar joint chuck test, the head of the ulna is held with a chuck pinch grip, and the wrist and the distal radius are held with a span grasp, with the thumb extended across the wrist joint. The radius is held firmly and the ulna is moved back and forth in palmar and dorsal direction. The test is done first in neutral, then in supination, and then in pronation. And that's actually an algorithm of how to decide what you can do for these injuries when you are fixing these complex uh, fractures uh, at any time point while 
you are facing them for the first time intraoperatively. Uh, so also arthroscopic assessment can be done. And if you suspect uh, triangular fibrocartilage problems, uh, or many open approach and of course uh, open approach to manage uh, these uh, subluxations, which we can discuss in details. Wiring is another option that can be undertaken in order to fix them temporary in the case of acute management of these. And luckily enough for trauma surgeons who aren't dedicated upper limb surgeons, usually it reduces the distal radio ulnar joints flips into position with this, and then you have to do the chuck test as per the algorithm and try to make sure you reduce it back into position and ultimately you can achieve the final fixation. So there is, uh, we have to be aware that there is uh, no reference standard exist for this specific treatment. Binning of the radius to the anna in the position of the dexter radio ulnar joint reduction is possibly the most commonly reported procedure in larger case series. And looks like uh, from all results, it appears to be excellent results. So I still do it. If I'm suspecting other injuries, I have a low threshold to investigate this and do it. Uh, if uh, you are in doubt, uh, always, uh, you, you know, a second stage surgery would be important. So in case of unstable, a large anastyloid, uh, if you have no fracture of the ulna, you can do the pinning. If there is instability, then maintain stability has been reported to be achieved with screw or tension band fixation of the other styloid fracture if mandated. Uh, if you cannot reduce it after anatomic reduction of radial shaft fracture, that means there is a soft tissue interposition. And so open reduction to remove the soft tissue and triangular fibrocartilage repair with whatever technique, either transosseous or uh, transosseous or uh, yeah, or anchors uh, like I, I tend to use a push lock anchor myself, or any or any the other approach would be the best option, like what you can see. Okay, so for Gilliazi fractures, we should be aware that it's not an easy fracture, especially the distal radio ulnar joint is a cause of disability in a lot of patients, and I have seen patients uh, many years down the line with instability of the distal radio ulnar joint that has been struggling with it over the years. It uh, it is a serious injury that needs a lot or that needs proper management at all time points. So. Next, last important fracture here of the forearm, sorry for talking for long, it's a Montagia fracture, or what many now regard as one of the elbow instabilities. So Montagia is a, an elbow problem, Giliazi is a wrist problem. Montagia is there is a trans olecranon elbow dislocation. It is. It has been defined or it is named after Giovanni Battista Montegia, and it is a fractured dislocation of the proximal ulna and radius, which is two to five percent of all fractures. Badu is the most common classification system, and Ring has uh, popularized uh, has also another classification system. But this uh, Montagia describes that fracture uh, in 1814. However, until a few decades ago, the eponym Montagia fracture was also used to indicate complex, uh, uh, complex uh, variants of the Montagia fracture, which Montagia have never claimed that it is related to his classification. And since then, we, un we have been uh, studying in deep details, the other variants and other important structures. One structure to highlight while we're talking about this, because it's also a common injured structure, which is the lateral collateral ligament complex, which is composed, as you can see in these pictures, from the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, accessory lateral ulnar ligament, radial collateral ligament, 
and the annular ligament. An isolated radial shaft fracture is uncommon in adults because the forearm function as a ring and an associated engine should always be suspected. It is similar to the concept in we follow in pelvic ring injuries, in which a single fracture of a ring structure is unlikely. So traditional fractures within 7.5 centimeter of the radiocarbal joint, people consider to be a Gilyazi fracture. However, in Montesia, you can always do your best to make sure we're not missing any of these fractures. Jupiter has classified, further classified type two uh, injury, sorry, of Badu, which is the apex posterior into these four variants. And we have to understand few things when we're discussing uh, this type of injuries. It's an elbow injury. It is a trans dislocation. There are a lot of predictors for uh, prognosis after this type of injury and should all bear in mind. We have to restore the normal alignment whenever we're fixing these. And we have to restore the elbow stability. So if there is an associated coronoid buttress, radial head fractures, lateral ligament complex, you have to identify these acutely and imagine, manage it accordingly. It's all about restoration of length and the curvature in forearm fractures. So if you fix, the, you can fix it, it goes back into position if it is done anatomic. If it's not done anatomic, as you can see, there will always be subluxation of the radial head. We have to understand different variables uh, uh, when we are assessing these. I think uh, CT scans are always important to identify these. These are pictures uh, from uh, Prof. Watt's presentation, and you can see different uh, Variants, different classification system has been uh, pro proposed, and uh, for each of these, def oh, we have to identify the best option in managing all of them. This is the writing to classification, which actually include Montesia fractures as part of elbow instability, which I think makes a lot of sense. It's not; it's more like an elbow instability problem than a forearm instability problem. However, there is a big overlap, and I think we should bear that in mind whenever we are assessing these. Now we are going to talk about certain complications you can have uh, uh, when managing forearm injuries, and I promise that's the last part of my presentation. We can see segmental problems here. Malunion is a common problem for poorly done radial uh, uh, postpone for arm fractures. You have to understand the problem. You have to understand uh, the radiographs. CT scan is crucial. AO planning is uh, crucial in order to plan for the revision surgery. And there are different variants that you can use on managing these. Uh, always uh, assess uh, distal radio ulnar joint stability, determine the reason of lack of motion, understand if you're planning for an osteotomy for a malunion, you have to obtain CT or MRI scan, do detailed preoperative drawings in order to determine the best option for what you're planning to do. Warn patients that these are at increased risk of nerve injury. Approach similar to managing the original ones, but it should be an extensive approach in order to manage all. These patients might have an associated abnormality of the distal or proximal radio ulnar joint. When consenting these patients, you have to report 48 complication rate was noted in previous studies. And this include infection, loss of function, heterotopic ossification, delayed non-union or non-union. The other complications that can happen would be the non-union because they are a functional unit you know, if you not follow adequate techniques, you can have this complication. It's important to achieve stability. It's important to understand whether it's a biologic or a mechanical failure. And when you are assessing these patients, you have to warn them about a high complication rate as well while undertaking these procedures. Options, 
You can use cancellous autograft. You can use tricortical iliac crest autograft. And of course, other options. It's not an easy thing to undertake. If you get it right first time, you can avoid the need for all these complicated surgeries. Hence, who does it matter? Yes, it matter. You have to get it from the right from the start. And these are underestimated injuries that I remember we used to manage them lightly. It's not a light injury. And these patients are, might end up with serious limitations and disabilities if they are not managed proper, properly from the start. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Very, very comprehensive presentation. Thank I think uh, for anyone who watches this, it's, it's almost complete. And that doesn't allow me a lot of questions. But still, we have just uh, two questions. Now, yes. Mohammed, what do you think is the role for intramedullary nailing in the forearm fracture, especially if it's segmental? Yes, I think there is a good indication for doing so. Uh, it depends on actually, so, you know, for pediatric patients, uh, I, I'll have a very low threshold to do a 10 snail myself. But in order to, it's a problem with uh, intramedullary fixation, it, it might be harder to achieve adequate rotation control. And we, you know, in the biomechanical slides, which I've put in the early, uh, put them early in the presentation, I think it's really important to achieve the rotation uh, in this. So if you can achieve proper rotation, especially with segmental fractures, I, I, I totally understand it might be harder. But you know, the good thing about the forearm, it's, uh, you know, you can have an extensile approach managing everything. Of course, it's a lot of soft tissue dissection, but it's balanced between uh, doing the quickest procedure uh, and, uh, you know, minimal invasive while actually achieving good functional outcome as well. Thank you, Mohammed, for that. Thank you. Uh, the other question is, uh, you have shown the picture of an introchial membrane reconstruction, right? From the right. Which one? Here. Sorry? Introchial membrane reconstruction. Yes. And what are the indications for this particular procedure? And what is a typical factor geometry? So, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's even, you know, in the most experienced hands, it, it's not done commonly because uh, luckily we don't see patients who are still struggling with this. But you know, for those who had history compatible with Essex Toprovsky patients who actually, I, last one I've done was someone who had radial head resection and they had shortening and then that led to a lot of instability in the, inter, in the forearm. So after radial head reconstruction, still they have some instability. And then when we did the large segment reconstruction, they assumed full function because it's, it's very, you know, the arm is uh, undertake mainly meticulous uh, functions. So if there is any bit of instability or problems, it affects the function. And uh, for young patients who are manual, manual uh, laborers or those who are like surgeons or professional athletes, they will be struggling with this. But it's not the problem still, as I've mentioned, the outcome is poor in these patients. And we still need to understand more about it in order to achieve the best outcomes we can achieve. I think we require more long-term studies and even level yeah, one data, right? 100%. And the problem is, you know, as I said, you know, even big centers, you don't have a large series. So I think with more uh, collaborative studies, uh, including different uh, patients from different places, we can answer a few questions as well. And just one last question before we wind up. You mentioned about the right intent classification for the coronoid, right? Now there's a te tr tendency to use this column concept of uh, for the coronoid. So do you think it's a useful classification compared to what has been done in the past by Sean or Driscoll? Do you think the writing then has an advantage over the conventional one? No, I personally think the writing then has addressed some of the problems with the pro original ones uh, proposed by uh, Sean O'Driscoll uh, O'Driscoll from uh, from uh, from Mayo Clinic. I think uh, both uh, because in the writing tone it gives you a better idea uh, because if you look here it divides it mainly focus on the facet in the coronoid and that actually understanding the mechanism of injury will enable you to understand how to manage the 
problem because it's simple in trauma surgery it's simple you know you had the problems that happens that way you fix it by putting the forces on the opposite way and so i think both classifications are really important but personally i think the writing to classification which actually is based on a lot of the work done by mori and uh, odrescol and of course uh, popularized by other mods but i think the writing to classification is really a, a very good classification and if you look in this uh, uh, slide you can see you know when you define the mechanism of injury it gives you a treatment algorithm as well what you can do what you can fix first so i think uh, we can make uh, the best of both words by knowing post classifications i think you can make better decisions right yes definitely, definitely. Okay. and uh, the thing is with elbows you know the problem with elbow fractures uh, historically, they were associated with poor outcomes, but uh, because we were managing, we weren't managing them in the best way. And now we understand more. The other problem with elbow injuries as well is that the bailout options isn't great. You know, you can go and fix an echo femur fracture, and usually the answer would be a hip replacement at that. Same will be a proximal humeral fracture. You know, you can do a reverse or a total shoulder replacement at that. But with elbows, uh, bailout options aren't great. A total elbow replacement is reserved for low demand patients with, uh, you know, uh, and you with a lot of restrictions. And usually this type of injuries happen in active young adults. So if you, you, we have a golden opportunity initially to fix them. Thank you, Mohammed. I think that's all the questions that we have for the session. Fantastic lecture, very, very comprehensive. And I'm Thank sure this is going much. to reach to a lot of people all over the world. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you very much, Tesha. Thank you, everyone who attended. Thank you. Bye-bye.